So many people are looking to find out what's going on in the world, yet they are stuck finding information about useless information. To help filter through the nonsense, we'll be going through what you need to know in our news segment called IWC News. I am Noah Montag, and I'm going to introduce my co-host, Joseph Miller. Please continue, Joseph. Will do. Uh, so we'd like to discuss a little bit uh, this week about big news in the pharmaceutical industry. First off, Amazon is announcing that they are going to uh, be more involved in or be, be having more competitive pricing in the in 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 its drug in its uh, drug related businesses. Um, recently, or in the last couple of years, first they've acquired PillPack. PillPack is pretty much instead of having to go to the pharmacy, they have a giant pharmacy and they send it to you. So that was originally put a lot of pharmacies into the hotspots and making it a little difficulty, especially for companies like Rite Aid and uh, Walgreens, which are struggling across the past few years. Um, this really put a uh, put a big, uh, this really stifled a lot of growth and made it very difficult. And certain companies like Rite Aid almost went out of business. It was recently bought out by Walgreens. But uh, this is going to put an even larger pressure being that Amazon is going to be cutting, essentially, um, you, you know, cutting a ton of prices uh, when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, drug pricing. On top of that, we see another headway going on in the pharmaceutical industry, which are uh, Trump's uh, preferred, Trump's preferred, preferred nation. Um, Basically what Trump's executive order does is that it okay, says that if there's a product in Germany, let's say that you buy a Tylenol for a dollar, then on the Ameri on America, we should have the same exact right. Yeah, it's, it's um, because drug companies are obviously very international, especially the major ones. Um, and they sell drugs across the world. And there are different prices in each country. And so Trump's executive order says, okay, so if that's going on there, we should have the same thing here. Um, okay. And clearly drug companies were very against it, but Joseph will speak more about that. Yeah, sorry, I mentioned uh, preferred nations. I, I was just, that wasn't the correct name. It was most favored nations. And essentially, yeah, basically uh, it's a very, Trump had created a very new uh, approach to healthcare, which is very free market. It's not really something most people thought about when it came to, or most people talked about really when it came to the um, pharmaceutical and even the um, the medical industry. Most people think when they, they try to regulate Democrat or Republican in the past, it's mostly looking for some sort of regulations to try to go after prices, even bipartisan. The whole thing a couple of years ago with um, with the EpiPen and the price gouging, um, really that everyone was looking to regulate. Trump had, uh, with Trump's executive order, with his most favored na uh, nation's uh, executive order, it's really going to change the way um, we buy medicine. It's really going to change healthcare. It's a big question, of course, how this, how that, can, that would, that could p play out in a Biden administration. It, but uh, that's that's still yet to be seen. But in terms of its at least short-term impact, it'll really, you know, it'll really make it'll really make price drug pricing more competitive. It'll cut into margins of all of pharmaceutical companies pharmacy companies, and even doctors. Um, and this is on top of uh, Trump's other plan, which is likely not going to come into uh, play if there's, a tri if there's a Biden presidency, which is the, which, which Trump, what basically Trump wanted to do was try to create a uh, price transparency at, um, at, at all medical facilities. There's a big problem mostly due to historically to insurance companies, or because uh, the way insurance companies work when they um, when they pay for things is essentially there needs to be a uh, some sort of almanac or some sort of list of pricing that uh, at hospitals and essentially they need a, a a list price if you will and essentially what the uh, what the insurance companies do is they can go back to their clients and say, we, you know, we pay only like 20% of list price or whatever. And it looks very good for the pharmaceutical companies. And it's even better for the customers because customers see if I go to these, you know, these, uh, these hospitals, then what's going to happen is, you know, uh, I'm going to pay after I pay a hundred thousand dollars. But if I, if I go, you know, with my insurance company, I only pay $20,000 or whatever. So because of the way insurance companies work and it, it made it very complicated. And not only that, but it got to the point where you can't even ask for a price anymore. The insurance, the insurance companies are the ones with the pricing. With you, you can't even go to you can't even go to the front desk of a hospital and say how much is you know how much is going to cost to remove my kidney. Uh, I, I, obviously, 
it's a little different than a regular purchase, but it's, but when you think about the amount of money people spend on medicine, on amount on surgery, et cetera, it's a, it's, it's a little odd that you don't get the, the bill afterwards. So it's very interesting to see that there's a new approach into healthcare and it's a very free market. And if you think about it, it's very competitive. I don't know how this might play out in, tr in terms of you know more procedural medicine, but in terms of pharmaceutical, in terms of medicine, you know, I could definitely see people saving if anywhere, the estimates have been anywhere between 50 and 80% on costs. And that's a humongous difference. When you look at it, when, when people are constantly talking about health healthcare issues, I think that that's gonna make a big change into people's pockets. Um, you know, and now Montag, please share with us some of the election results. So I know everyone's probably bored of the election, but we're just gonna do a very quick uh, segment. So just to give you the highlights, and the no-nonsense facts. Um, obviously, re-elections results are still coming in very slowly. Um, we're still unsure exactly where Trump lawsuits are going, but we should know within the next three weeks a final answer, although the, presumptu yeah. the presumption is right now is that Joe Biden will become the next president. Hopefully, we can um, figure out what's going on with the lawsuits before Inauguration Day. Yeah. Um, and um, in terms of the House of Representatives, which is probably the most... Uh, uh, the thing that people are interested in at this point is that right now the current count is 222 Democrats to 205 Republicans. However, there's still numerous races still to be called, and it's going to be a very slim uh, Democratic majority in the House. Um, it looks very likely that Speaker Nancy Pelosi will continue. Um, however, uh, we are still unsure if she has the votes, um, and also would depend on how slim the majority is. And in terms of the Senate, there's, there's, a, uh, there's two Senate races, uh, two runoffs going on. And one thing that, should, that should, just shook up the race yesterday is that Kelly Loeffler tested positive for COVID-19, which could impact her campaign going forward. I'm unsure how that will impact the race, but I'm, it will surely do so. So just a couple other notes on the uh, what's going on with the House of Representatives. There are currently eight races that are that are not called. Four of them are currently uh, with a, are reporting over 80% of votes with a very large lead to Republicans, you know, almost double, double digits. Um, so, you know, it'd be very hard pressed to suggest that they're gonna go to the Democrats. There are another three Republican leading um, uh, 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 races where 98% uh, reporting, but they're all within 1%. So we could, we, it's likely we could see recounts, especially in one where it's, almost, where it's under, it's, it's under, you know, 0.1% uh, in terms of the difference between the, uh, the winner, uh, the Republican and the Democratic can candidate. So we will probably see some recounts there. And there's one final race also leading Republican. It's still a toss up um, in terms of who might win it, it because some of the counties that are leaning in New York for this, for this race are, are still very heavily Democratic counties, but it could go either way. So it's likely that the Republicans will pick up anywhere from a minimum four to maybe even eight seats, um, I'd see very unlikely that they'll- that Of they'll, those, uh, they're still not called. They already picked they're, up they're a only, nice amount. I'm saying there are only eight left that aren't called. And yeah. I believe, I, and it would be very unlikely that they would get less than six. For sure, they will not have less than four. Yes. Um, and then now in terms of a little bit of different topic from the election, but a little bit uh, similar is that- um, the big news that happened this week is that uh, Parler app is joined conservatives from Twitter and Facebook due to the Trump election, specifically the election results and about how Twitter was putting on all these um, symbols saying that like, oh, this election is disputed, uh, this fact is disputed, whatever it is. And um, a lot of conservatives were outraged by it. Um, and obviously we, we are unsure if this will impact Twitter and Facebook long term. Um, however, 4 million people is a, still a significant amount of people, no matter what the way you look at it. But Joseph will walk you through the exact numbers about what we're talking and percentage-wise. Yeah, I put some numbers together. I want to make it clear where Parler is, and I would like to also make it clear where some of the larger um, and more trending um, social media is to try to get a perspective of what Parler is, and maybe the numbers might tell us if there's a future or not. So recently... Since the election, Parler added 4 million downloads. Um, this is on top of the uh, estimated anywhere from 
from uh, you know four to six million they had previously. Um, they usually pick up pick up uh, you know significant amounts, never this significant before, but usually pick up pick up significant uh, me a membership or user bases when it comes to uh, when it comes to Republican or when certain members of uh, uh, certain politicians complain about free speech. So whenever something significant happens where Republicans complain about free speech, so they find that a lot of people will flock to parlors. Recently or previously and over the summer during the rioting, you know, there were other times where Republicans would talk about free speech and, you know, you'd see like 100,000 switch the parlors. So 4 million is really significant, you know, in the last few weeks when, you know, previously it was only a couple hundred thousand at a time. And I wanted to kind of frame where this is compared to everyone else. So Snapchat has around 400 million users. About a Snapchat is not necessarily the direct competitor no, of but Parler. I mean, they're in the same field, but the real competitors is probably Parler's Facebook and Twitter. So, so yes, I'm, I'm going to get to that. I, I just wanted to discuss more of the short form social media as opposed to Facebook. Facebook is involves a lot more long form things and it's a lot larger being that it has things like Instagram and other things. So I, I, I want to mainly discuss more short form. So obviously Snapchat is not the biggest competitor, but I just wanted to also talk a little bit in terms of size of company. So Snapchat has around 400 million users, about three quarters are active. Um, obviously, or, or the reason why it's more active than you'll note some of the other big social media companies is, is because of uh, it, it's, it's in the most recent and arguably the most uh, advanced in terms of or the most um, trendy in terms of new features being added regularly. What about TikTok? So TikTok was not included because it's in terms of social media on the list I was reading, specifically because it was more um, it, it was more content based in terms of a streaming platform. That's why YouTube is also not on the list. YouTube is also considered would be considered the largest besides for Facebook social media platform. But uh, the way I was and the way some of the articles I was reading uh, parsed it was there's a difference between a streaming platform versus social media. So I agree there are nuances, but I, I'm really looking to speak to short form. Uh, uh, All right, so companies. Snapchat, Twitter, and Parler. Yeah, so, so and, and the reason also t TikTok is not there is um, we don't have such good numbers on TikTok. It's not a public company, or at least it's not completely owned by a public company. So we can't measure it on its own. That, that would be the other reason why I didn't want to focus. Uh, after that, we have Twitter, which is Parler's biggest competitor, which is, um, if you look at Parler's website, it's pretty much Twitter just in the color red. Um, but, uh, but Twitter has 300 million users, has a market cap of 35 billion, as opposed to Snapchat, Snapchat had 65 billion. And about only half, less than half are active, which is very surprising. But when you think about it, before uh, President uh, Trump ran for the election, people were actually discussing of Twitter being bought out, or Twitter had some massive losses. So you really see the uh, you know, politics, the excitement around politics, to, to put it in a nice way. I'm really riled up Twitter. Uh, I didn't, it, it is not yet profitable, but again, but recently, in recent years, it's going to get very close. So it'd be actually- yeah, but no matter what happens, whether or not Parler takes, uh, gains more market share or not, I think that for long term, it seems that conservatives are not going to be satisfied with Twitter, especially when their tweets are being labeled. And I think that actually will hurt Twitter in the long term, in the sense that it creates less of a discourse between liberals and conservatives. And if conservatives have their own website, the less of a discourse will actually make sure people spend less time on Twitter because if they're speaking to the same minds, they may not spend as much time on it. Yeah, I, I, think, I, I think that's correct. If Donald Trump was not president, if Donald Trump did not run for president, I would, Twitter wouldn't have been close to where it is in terms of profitability. Many of its users and more importantly, its active users have only really come out in the last four years, which is very significant. That because it's not only, yeah, because it's not only about being active on Twitter, it's about how much time you spend on it. Exactly. If you spend an hour versus a half hour, that, make, that could make a big major difference. But, but I'm saying the reason why I'm stressing active users is because you can read some of these like Chinese uh, social media websites and it'll be like, you know, like like one billion, like some crazy number. Like, uh, and, and you'll no, see that- WeChat's in a different league than- I, I'm, I'm not talking about WeChat. Game. I'm not even talking about WeChat. I, I don't remember the other names of the other ones, but they were like, they're like a billion or whatever. And it's, it's not just China, but obviously mainly China and India, 
and then you find that like there's like there's like 100 million units it's like 10 percent or whatever so in terms of but in terms of an american-based company you really rely on it facebook while it has you know two billion users uh oh a little more than half of them are active it's really important uh, you know, how many active users you have compared to how many accounts there are, because it makes it, it makes it obviously make a big difference in just how many people are clicking. It's true we want, or any company may want a active users to be on for long periods of time, but the ability to also show, to spread ads to more people, to have more of a footprint, that's, very, so that's something very significant that Facebook has a massive advantage over. It's not yet clear uh, what Parler is going to be doing uh, to be profitable. They have certain things uh, th where they have these partnership programs for people who want some sort of advertising. But it, from from the articles I've been reading, it's very difficult for a pure conversation. I was looking into it. So I wanted to share maybe a little bit with my experience uh, for for uh, pure conversation, so people could hear kind of what to expect and what the difficulties I've 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 experienced from a business perspective. And as well as when I was looking for help online um, to try, you know, to see who else is going, so to see, you know, if, some, if other people were going through this and how they circumvented the experiences, the uh, the somewhat negative experiences that I had, um, I found that a lot of people had it and didn't have answers on how to fix it. So number one, uh, the, the biggest issue I've had with Parler is the um, is the customer service. Um, I, I tried reaching out to Parler. I was trying to make edits to the account. The problem is, once you make it, once you make an account, everything in your account is locked and it can't be reused. So if you have an email address, you can't make multiple accounts. If you have a phone number, you can't make multiple accounts. So what that means is, if you made a phone number for a personal account and then wanted to make a business account instead, you can't, and they'll lock you out of both. And there's nothing you could do about it. And customer service won't even respond to uh, inquiries on how to change that or how to reset things, etc. It's also, uh, it's for, for users, especially business users, a lot of times people have different business accounts. For example, um, you know, Pure Conversation would have its own account. IWC might, uh, you know, our news segment might have an account. Uh, you know, the Dear Joseph podcast, uh, which is also one of our podcasts, might have a, uh, an account as we do on Twitter. And, we, and you'll find that we have several different accounts which are focused on different segments. Some are news, some are in some of our interview programs, some are our finance. And you'll find that, um, that that is very useful for getting out our content. And you'll find that our followers are very different. Our finance, for, for a finance account, we have a bunch of different other finance bloggers following us. For our interview account, we have uh, mostly, uh, you know, regular non-business uh, related people um, and et cetera. And it, it's hard to create a brand image or separate brand image, especially when you want a segment, you'll find that also, for example, take a company like Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola will obviously have Coke, they'll have a Sprite, and they'll have you know hundreds of different accounts on Twitter. But to make different accounts, they're going to have to create different business entities and different uh, different user different uh, email addresses, uh, different and, and even different phone numbers associated with the line, which is frustrating from a business perspective. Now I don't know if this is going to be Parler going forward. I can imagine that pretty soon they're going to realize that they're too very similar to Twitter, but I think I think it's just important to note that uh, you know that that parlor is very small, it's very segmented, and it's hard to see that there's going to be so much growth in parlor. Now I assure I, I can assume that a lot of the mistakes are are going to be fixed, and a lot of the issues that are people having are going to be fixed. But the question is, where are they going to build people, build up their market? Their market is currently people who are frustrated with censorship on Twitter or frustrated with censorship on Facebook or are or frustrated with claims of censorship on these platforms. And it's a big question, um, can they continue to grow and are they going to be sustainable with the yet less, less users? And next week, hopefully we'll do a uh, segment on uh, the break between Fox News and Newsmax TV, which is actually really exciting. Um, it's all right, but that will be a uh, treat for next week. So just get excited for that. Um, in terms of a different, a totally different topic, um, but a very important one is, and it's also exciting, is that the the vaccine seems to be on the route. Um, Pfizer this past week applied for a, a EUA, which is an emergency use authorization, which is obviously uh, very exciting, as I said. But um, 
the main point is, is that now that we that they're, they moved on to the next step, in about two to three weeks, the FDA is going to meet. So on December 8th through 10th, the FDA is going to have an advisory, uh, independent advisory, meet with them, and they'll make their recommendations on whether or not they should approve it. Assuming that they approve it, which is, I would say, the presumption, then it could be as early as December 12th that people start receiving actual vac vaccines into their body. And one thing to note is that uh, based on the evidence that Pfizer and Moderna have right now, but you don't really get full, uh, not full, but closer to full um, immunization until after you get your, your booster, which is in a month later. So it could be by before inauguration day, by January 12th or 13th, people actually get their second shot, which would be really exciting. And um, one thing to note is right now, um, the plan is, is that the federal government's gonna make recommendations on how states should use the vaccines. However, it is up to states to decide who gets the vaccines, where do they go first? I mean, like, should they go to frontline workers, health, uh, healthcare workers, or to older elderly people with core morbidities and things of that nature? And one thing that's still up in the air is that there were a few states, including uh, most predominantly uh, Governor Cuomo, who said that there was going to be- Governor advice. Cuomo is, just a fact correction, Governor Cuomo is not a state, but a governor of a state. Yes. So Governor Cuomo um, of the state of New York, of the state of New York, he um, he made he uh, made an advisory committee on whether or not uh, New Yorkers will get the vaccine, um, which a lot of people were very frustrated about because the second they get the vaccine, they wanted to take it. But he says that there won't be a delay uh, when the federal government approves it and when he approves it. But we'll have to see um, if there is a delay. Um, in New York, or it could be other states as well, but we're not sure about that yet. Um, and obviously, um, I'm sure, as I'm sure some of you have heard, it was a kind of a war of words between President Trump and Governor Cuomo, which was uh, very interesting. Um, and in terms of, and finally, um, something to note is that people obviously are hoping for herd immunity, which they say is about 70% of the population becoming immune. And so um, one thing to note is that there's, there are, the, of course, the anti-vaxxers who are never going to take a vaccine, but there's a lot of people in the middle that are just not sure whether or not they're going to take it. So I think that um, it's really going to be up to politicians and doctors and things like that to actually convince the people to do it. And um, based on the data that and the polls that people have done, it does not seem that people are very interested in taking the vaccine. They said about, they did a poll a, few, a month or two ago, and they said only about 50% of people would take a vaccine, which is clearly lower than the threshold that America needs to reach herd immunity. So that's just something to be on the lookout for and something to be a look at on what politicians and doctors are saying um, as we get closer to uh, rele uh, releasing the vaccine. Um, and in terms of just another topic, which is also a little bit, uh, which is fun and cool, inaugurations are always fun and cool, especially the military always. parade that follows afterwards. However, we, have, we are not sure, especially with the President Biden, um, exactly what the inauguration is going to look like. Um, there's a lot of festivities that usually happen on inauguration day, including balls and very, very fancy things. And I assume that a lot of those will not happen. Um, including the parade across Washington, D.C. Um, due to the pandemic. But um, I guess it's too early to see about that. And our final topic for tonight, which is also um, uh, very interesting, is that... No, it's pretty exciting, actually. But um, one thing to note is that, first of all, construction prices are soaring. Um, specifically, lumber prices have gone up a tremendous amount during the pandemic and this month specifically. And I think that one thing that's very interesting is that a lot of people are leaving the uh, more urban areas, including New York, and moving to play more places like Florida and Arizona and things of that, uh, Texas. things more suburban and Texas. And um, I think it's, I think that um, in my opinion, I don't think that this is necessarily the pandemic started people moving, uh, but I do believe that it has accelerated a trend that people are like, we can work virtually, why not work virtually in a nicer place, in a nicer environment, whatever it is, uh, whatever they find, um, what attracts them. So I think that this is something to be on the lookout for because 
we don't know how real estate's going to be affected in more urban areas and uh, what the longer term trends are. What do you think, Joseph? And for those of us who are really excited or those out there who are really excited about uh, you know, elections and really can't wait for you know, 2024, you know, we'll find that, um, that, that we'll see that, certain, that a lot of the larger states are likely going to be dropping in terms of electoral votes. It, it, really, it very much could be that Florida is going to be projected to have more electoral co uh, votes in the next election than New York. Right now, this year they were even, but if you look at the trend in terms of population growth, Florida has a, has a larger population growth. And in terms of uh, specifically people fleeing New York, so um, New York, at least New York City, New York City, it's unclear whether you know, other places of New York are gonna have this issue, but specifically New York City is having very big problems um, in terms of retaining its population. Whereas even the more urban uh, the, and, uh, places in Florida like Miami are growing. Um, and yeah, and that concludes this week's uh, IWC News. Thank you for listening. Make sure to like and subscribe on our various podcast platforms and the YouTube. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at Pure Convo Pod.